the God that he left me. I am the Lord, your healer. I sent my word and healed your disease. I am the Lord, your healer. Scripture says in this, the love of God was manifested towards us. That God has sent His only begotten Son into the world. That we might live through Him. And in this is love. Not that we loved God. But that He loved us. And He sent His Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sin. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. I can hardly think of words that can describe such love. I was far from God. In all my ways, my words and my actions. I was so far. As a young man, God got a hold of me. I didn't know what it meant to be born again. I didn't know that I could have a relationship with Him. I never suspected that God had a plan for When I was a sinner, God brought the truth of the gospel to my heart. He did that for you. Amen. He did that for each of us. We're so undeserving. Even after these many years, we are so undeserving of His love. But he has chosen to set his love on you. And he gave an evidence of that when he sent his own son to die for you and for me. There was no hope before I came to know Christ. But in Christ, you and I have inherited all Jesus said, remember me. Our mind raises every day on so many subjects. But I want to tell you the truth of that simple verse is so great and so grand and so out of world for you and for me that there is nothing that can compare with the love of Jesus. We come here today to remember that love. To remember the suffering that he received in his body for my sin and for yours. We gather here. We come here to remember to lift up our voice and our hearts to Him. And think about the cost of the greatest deed that has ever been done. And as we take this time this morning, I want you to remember, go back, remember the day when you came to salvation in Jesus Christ, when you became born again, born anew, in the fullness of life, when peace flooded in your soul, and 
the love of God and the presence of God became so real. And we thank and enjoy this and remember for one day soon we will see that heavenly place. We'll walk the streets of gold. We'll see those who have gone on before us and the myriads of people who God has brought by grace alone to salvation. We'll join around the throne of God. We'll raise our voices, our hearts, and our hands. We'll sing of the praises of Jesus. Today we have that privilege as well. So let's partake together. Let's give thanks. Let's remember from whence we have come and the hope that lives within our heart. said, remember me. victory that you won for yourself because you have never lost. You've never failed. You've always won. Yes. But a victory for us. Yes. A victory that we can't measure because it's so great, so grand. It will take all of eternity to know how much of a victory you have purchased for us. Yes. Yes. So we can live victoriously and live in a way that the faults and failures and, and all of the disgrace, all that wood is washed away by your sacrifice. Or yes, brought into a victory that is powerful and immeasurable. Yes. And we give thanks for it. In Jesus' name. Thank you. Amen. 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 Well, praise the Lord. All right. How many of you want to enter into service today? Amen. All right. If you haven't been doing that, you're missing a lot. You know, I, I used to, uh, when I was not in ministry, well before all that, I sat right where I sit, right where I sit now. I sat there because I found that when I was in that position, I was never distracted because I was like right there. And, uh, and I was able to enter in, and uh, I came from a shop in church. How many of you have been in a shop in church? Amen. Yeah. All right, well, you know, it's not a bad thing. I know some people kind of get a little uh, worried about that. So we're not gonna let it get out of control. Uh, I'm kind of in that business. When people get out of control, I know how to control them. That's what I do for a living. So we're not going to have that problem here. But if you want to feel that sense of, of uh, joy and you just want to praise the Lord or, or shout out amen or praise the Lord, that's great. I don't have no problem with that. And, and you know, I found that when I did that, not to be hurt, really, I can honestly say not to be hurt, but I, I did that. Because I, I believed Amen. what the Word was saying. Amen. And I was joyous and thankful for it. Yes. And so what happened is I found that I was really able to enter in Amen. when I became 
a part of what was happening. So I encourage you to do that. Amen? Amen. All right. Praise the Lord. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to the book of Romans, chapter 12. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. It is all that we need. It is the very life and sustenance that you have given to us to prepare us and make us ready for that day that we arrive in your heavens. And we pray that in Jesus' name that you would just bless then your word to our hearts. And we pray, Lord, that we will glean and walk from here being strengthened through your word. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to talk to you about a subject. The Christian strength is not about trying harder. It's about drawing nearer to God. Did you hear what I said? Yeah. The Christian strength is not about trying harder. How many of you have been there and done that? It's about drawing nearer to God. James 4, 8 says, draw near to God, and He will draw near to who? Yes. To you. Isaiah 40, 28-31 says this, The everlasting God, the Lord, the Creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable, and He gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Somebody say amen about that. Amen. And my text, which is found in Romans chapter 2, um, chapter 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God and what is good and acceptable and perfect. Amen. Now over the last several weeks we've been sharing about our need for change. Our need to repent for those areas that are out of place in our life. That we would make a definitive turning from sin and a resolute turning towards God in obedience. And how many of you believe that change is a good and necessary thing in life. How many of you think that that's true? I, I really believe it is. And I would say that most people want to see changes in their lives. We want to see our circumstances to change. We like to see a change in the people around us. We like to see a change in the world in which we live. But I would say that we often forget to look at ourselves and see that we are the ones that need to change the most. How many of you know that song? Amen. The truth is you probably have a lot more to do with changing, with change happening than you realize. You see, we, we kind of get this idea that, that God's just going to, you know, we're going to say a prayer and blink tomorrow, we're going to be a different person. How do you know that hasn't happened yet? Amen. <laughs> All right, maybe he's on a delay system here, I don't know. But I, I would say that we have to understand that we have a part in seeing our lives change. We have a lot more to do with change happening than you and I realize. You can't keep doing the same things the way you've always done them and hope or expect to get a different result because that just won't happen now for years I've tried to make things in my life change and I didn't get anywhere I would study the Bible and I try to put it to, into place I would go to church and hear a message and I it make me want to try harder then I would go to God and tell him how hard I was trying <laughs> 
I mean, I did everything I could. But I didn't change. I never seemed to have changed. How many of you have been there before? You know, you did your best, and then you think, well, I'll just give it more, and I'll just try harder. How many of you have seen a lot of good results out of that? <laughs> Bob did. All right, Bob. Good man. But you see, the problem was I was trying harder in my own strength, but what I needed was God's help. I needed to realize the truth about myself and my situation before I could get the help that God wanted to give me. Now, if you want to change your walk, you need to change your mind. Romans 12, 2 says this, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. That means changed by the entire renewal of your mind. So that you may prove for yourselves what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So how do we renew our mind? We renew it with this. This is what renews our mind. Yes. The average Christian, I read statistically, reads about five minutes a day. The average Christian picks this up and for the full time of maybe two commercials, he reads this Bible. See, God wants to renew our minds with His truth. And God's Word is full of life. Yeah. It is full of power. Yeah. It is full of the ability to change you and I. Now I want you to think for a minute about the inherent power that is in God's Word. I was reading Genesis this morning at 4 o'clock. And it said this in Genesis 1.14. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of heaven to, defy, to divide the day from night. And let them be signs and seasons for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. And catch the last four words. And it was so. God said, let there be light. And the universe was created by His command. Yes. His work yes. created that. This is His work. Do you think there's a little power going on here? Amen. Do you think so? Yeah. You see, the power of God is found in His Word. And when we talk about change, we have to understand the dynamis power that is in God's Word to change us and make us anew. And you and I can hardly envision the power that is inherent in God's Word. I will tell you that when you and I step in the face of heaven's streets, we will see things that we never saw before and wished we saw. And this is one of them. This book has the dynamic power of the Almighty God right here. Yes. And He gave it to you so that you might have His power at work in your life to change and grow and become who God wants you to be. You are what you think. Proverbs 23, 7 says this, As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Now, that word heart is not talking about your emotions. You know, I want to say that we live in a time uh, you know, in our world where emotions have been brought to the foremost place in life. Amen. But I want to say to you that the word here, heart, 
at least in this text, is referencing the soul. Now, we have a body, soul, spirit, and soul. And I'm, I'm going to give you just a quick synopsis so you understand the difference as you look at this scripture. The body is the outward form or house in which our soul and spirit dwell. It is the seat of our senses which make us world conscious, right? Amen. This is how we live. This is how we experience life on this earth. <clears throat> and that's our body. Our spirit is that invisible part of us which makes us God conscious. It is the seat of our conscience, our intuition, and our communion with God. It is where we distinguish right from wrong, or discern the Holy Spirit speaking to us, or moving upon us, or revealing truth to us, or having communion with God and worship with Him. You see, that soul is that inner being that makes us self-conscious. So we have the body that is world conscious, the spirit that is God conscious, and the soul is the inner being that makes us self conscious. It is the seat of the mind and emotions and will. It is where we think, feel, and decide. So your soul is mentioned here. In particular, it speaks of the mind. The battlefield upon which your spiritual conflicts are played out. How many of you know that? So here's where, you know, everybody thinks that here is where the problem is. It's not here. Here's the problem. See, the problem begins here. What's in your mind? Because what thoughts are in your mind is what you will do. It comes out here, but it starts here. You need to understand that. And you need to understand how powerfully this word can work upon your mind. It's a place, your soul is a place where your flesh and the devil battle against God's truth. And the Holy Spirit battles for control of your will. Why does the battle rage? Because the Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And this is the battle that you cannot afford to lose. The battle for change begins in your thought life. And that's why your mind is a spiritual battlefield. And whatever thoughts you choose to introduce into your mind and dwell on those things, it will be reproduced in your life. How many of you know that that's so? Amen. If you dwell on unrighteous thoughts, you could be sure it will result in unrighteous actions. If you think right thoughts, you will produce right actions. Actions are always traced back to our thinking because thought is the seed of a deed. It's true. Sow a thought and reap a deed. Sow a deed and reap a habit. Sow a habit and reap character. Did you see that progression? I'll say it to you again because I want you to think about it. Sow a thought and reap a deed. Sow a deed and reap a habit. Sow a habit, and you'll reap that character tree in your life. Sow a character, and reap a destiny. You see, you're shaped by your thoughts. You are what you think. Your perceptions, your perspectives, your attitude, your speech, your behavior, and the life you live are directly, directly shaped by your thoughts. A change of thinking results in a change of direction. If we want to live differently, we must begin to think differently. When we think differently, we will act differently. 
Correcting one's thinking is the foundation for change. Repentance is foremost a change of mind. Remember we talked about that? We talked about that in repentance these last two weeks. That there's a change of heart and a change of mind. Remember? We yes. talked about the two elements there. And this is getting back to that same subject here. Repentance is foremost a change of mind. It's a new way of thinking. A change of thought results in a change of behavior. Now, the book of Ephesians, chapter 4 of Ephesians, is the change chapter in the Bible. You may not know that. But God outlines the way in which you and I can see change in our life that will help us to draw closer to God. And if you turn to Ephesians chapter 4, and verse 22 and 23, let me begin with verse 22. It says, put off, and before I go any farther, in the original, although you don't read it probably in most of your your uh, Bibles, there is a U in front of that. There is, in the original, it is saying, you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to deceitful lusts. God says, put away, forsake, your old ways of thinking and acting that your corrupt nature adopts. And my text in Romans says, do not be conformed. Do not be conformed to this world. Do not allow ungodly influences and sinful and seductive culture that we live in to squeeze you into its mold. And that's what's happening, isn't it? In fact, today, much more so. There's pressure being put on people who claim Christ to do differently. They want to squeeze you into that mold. And all that you see in the corruptive influences around us in, on the uh, television, in society, on the news services, on our TVs, all of these are messages that are sent. And it's sent right to your mind. And these thoughts are bombarding you, helping you are endeavoring to help you to go in the wrong direction. And God says, do not be conformed to these ungodly influences of this seductive culture that tries to seduce and ensnare you. The minds and wills of Christians into thinking and acting like their contemporaries. Little by little, the current carries us a little farther. Have you seen that happen in your life? Have you seen that sometimes, you know, we don't make these big changes in our life. Usually change comes along in a little ways. We make a little step here. But if we're allowing all these corruptions to fill our mind, well, you know what we do? We just take a little step. Probably a little a couple weeks, a couple months later, we take just a little bit more. You know, before you know it, you and I are standing in an altogether different place. And it happens. And you don't recognize. You don't recognize the fact that even though you don't support what kind of lifestyle we see living in our our present uh, social agenda. Nonetheless, I will tell you this, that the more you get exposed to it, what happens? You deteriorate a little farther and farther unless you are drawing closer to God, unless you are renewing your mind with 
this. Now, how many of you spend significant time in our present culture, just with working with other people and watching television or being around people in conversation? You probably spend a number of hours every day, maybe many hours every day. So you have these influences coming into your life. And then you go home and you pick your Bible up and you read a couple of verses. Ah, got that. I'll set it up. You see, we have to be careful because what happens is that we are allowing all this corruption to come into our mind and try to lead us down all the wrong roads. And so we have to be careful. That's why he says, the scripture says, you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to deceitful lusts. And do not be conformed. Do not allow those ungodly influences of this culture to squeeze you into its mold. That current that little by little carries you just a little bit further away than you ought to be. A change of thinking results, a change, results in a change of direction. You may say, well, what's wrong with my thinking? Why does my thinking need to be renewed? Well, here's another mind in the road. Your mind has a fallen bent. Now, if you look up that word bent in the original, what it talks about, a strong inclination to go in the wrong direction. Is that you? That's me. We all come to those places where our carnal self wants to send us in all the wrong directions. Now, I, I often... Because I'm a simple-minded man, I offer you simple examples. And you know, I grew up in a different culture, not like the uh, culture it is today. When I was young, you had uh, Daffy Duck and uh, you had uh, all the Mickey Mouse and all those things yeah. in culture we had. But uh, what I always saw when Daffy Duck was out doing his thing, uh, you know, he would be tempted to act in a certain way. And all of a sudden, this this evil angel would, uh, I mean, the evil devil would stand on this side and say, ah, go do that. And then the angel would show up on the other side, no, don't do that. And, and here he is, he's going like this. But in, in a sense, it's very true. In a sense, we are always being bombarded. It's true. And we have to bring the influence of Scripture to you and I. What's wrong with our thinking? It's not just the culture, but it's the fact that we have a natural bent, a strong inclination to go in the wrong direction. It's there. How many of you know, how many of you know that it's there? That's why we're called sinners. Our mind has a spirit. That is a mindset. A set way of thinking. And our minds are not by nature God-worshipping minds. They are by nature self-worshipping minds. Oh, I guess like that. <laughs> that is the spirit of our minds. And there's a natural bent or orientation. There's a natural man's thinking is always to directed towards the things that pertain to the flesh. Our physical, our material, our emotional needs. Look at people around you. Maybe look at yourself. We value things that God doesn't necessarily value. We are brought to having the nice home, having the nice car, enjoying life, not working too hard so we can have recreation and enjoy ourselves. You see, what, where we go is a natural bent. It's the way our mind thinks. But Jesus said, from within, for from within, out of the heart, proceeds evil thoughts, 
adulteries, fornications, murders, threat, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. You see, all these things Jesus said is within the heart of man. And all these evil things come from within and they defile the man. That's what's wrong with our thinking. But our mind tends to suppress God's word. Romans 1.8 For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. He said, well, that's talking about ungodly people. Yes, but you have to understand that there is still at work the influences of a fallen world that comes to bear on your mind every day. Right? Amen. Our mind is resistant to God's truth. Ephesians 4 says this, verse 17 and 18, You must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their mind, for they are darkened in their understanding and alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, due to the hardness of their heart. You see, our mind not only tends to go in the wrong direction, but it can be hardened, resistant, rebellious, even unwilling to submit and yield to God's truth. Have you done that? I have. I'm the only guy here. I, I tell you, I love an honest man. Yes, we do. There are times that we know that we, that we shouldn't do something and we do it. Tell me you haven't done that. In fact, I will tell you, you probably do it at least once a day. Yeah. Just wow. You see, we have to be careful. <laughs> Our minds suppress God's truth. Our mind resists God's truth. Our mind tends to question God's truth. Look at 2 Corinthians 10.5. It says, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. You see, our, beyond our minds and our fall, fallen bent, there's a tendency in every one of us to resist God's truth. Our thoughts, our reasoning, our emotions often lead us to question or doubt or disbelieve or even deny truth. And it leads us to places of fear and anxiety and despair. And so what's the remedy? It is renewing our minds with truth. And renewing the work of the Holy Spirit by yielding to His promptings in our lives. The catalyst for change in spiritual growth is renewing our minds with truth. That's why you and I need to get this Bible out. It's not how much you read. It's how much attention you pay to what you read. Amen. Amen. You can read four verses and you can think on some of those verses for a, for a half hour. And, and, and walk away so fed and built up in your spirit like you've never known. But many people come and they take their Bible and they just figure it's, you know, all right, I got 10 minutes, uh, I could probably read it with a chapter. I'll read a chapter for you. And you know what? When we come to a verse and we don't understand what it means, we don't look it up. You know, there's a, a Bible program, I offer it to anyone in the church. It's, it's called. Esau. I've seen if you were going to know. Esau. Now, you know why I push this? Because I will tell you that it's such a great program filled with, I, I you know, before, I'm old, but before uh, this came out and computers were, you know, 
available. I spent thousands of dollars on books trying to learn how to interpret the scripture. This comes along. It's absolutely free. It's one of the best programs on the market. It gets updated several times a year. It has uh, just a, a world of knowledge about the Bible. And it's available to you and it's free. Available to you and it's free. Free. <laughs> you got it, right, free? How many of you like free? Yeah. It's free. And you can get it for me. Somebody has it right now. They're going to bring it back. I, I even lose track of who has it because we just give it around. And you put it on your computer and you can learn everything you never understood before. It's made available. You can do that. So if you took that, and I find myself, as I read, I find I read less. I read less because I focus more on the few things I read. And I will tell you, I benefit much more than just to read and say I did it. I benefit because I begin, begin to stop at the scriptures I don't understand, and I get into Esword, and I look up the keywords, and I get a picture, and you always hear me, I say to you, in the original. How many times do you hear me say that? In the original, in the original. You can go back, and you, you will see the fullness of God's truth It'll blossom in front of you in a, in a way that you'll go. Your mouth will drop. The clarity of God's truth. And He'll build you up. Now get in your mouth and it'll shape you. See, you don't understand how powerful this is. You're missing it. power that it is described to be found here. It's actually the word that we get in the English translation, dynamite. Dunamis power. It's right here. Is it getting into here? See, this is what God calls us to. A change of mind. To be renewed. To be transformed. By the renewing of our mind with truth. And also by the renewing powers of God's Spirit. Titus 3 5 says, God saved us not because of the works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. It is at this first and can and continual work of the Holy Spirit to renew our minds and souls. We are radically dependent on the Spirit of God. But when we follow this initiative and stand in the name of God, there's lasting thinking patterns that are renewed. bent in your mind is straightened out. It leads to renewed behavior, renewed habits. It produces a new you. You habitually and naturally and unconsciously become more like Jesus. Good morning. Good morning. Let you all stand. The renewal of our mind with truth doesn't just happen. It's not Osmosis. It's a discipline. Yeah. Yes. We need to renew our thought patterns by thinking what is true and right. Philippians says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things that are true, and whatsoever things that are honest, and whatsoever things that are just, and whatsoever things that are pure, and whatsoever things that are lovely, or of good report, or of have any virtue or any praise, think on these things. You got it right here. That's all you need.
this, this will change your thoughts. Your thoughts will change your behavior. Hear what's right. Read what's right. Watch what's right. Associate with the right people. Your thoughts and opinions will change. Amen. God will give you the power and the ability to live a righteous life. Amen. In the power of God's Spirit. might change our mind, renew our mind, do a transformation in us. We love you. We want our minds to be changed. Lord, you said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. With these thoughts in mind, we graciously ask you that you would use your transforming power to touch our minds and our hearts. That we might be regenerated with your life and your transforming power. Try. It's not about trying harder. It's about drawing nearer to you through your word. I pray a prayer today over every person that has gathered here. I know that every one of us have been flooded and inundated with corruption on every side in this world that is soon approaching the return of Jesus Christ. And I pray a covering over every person's mind. I pray that, Lord, you will cause their hearts, everyone here, to have a hunger and a thirsting to hear from you in their daily devotion time as they read their Bible. I pray that the truth of God will explode off the pages of that book and it would flood the soul and heart and mind of every person. Let there be a searching heart, a desire to draw near. I pray that your word will powerfully change us eradicating sin and corruption and compromise and drawing us closer to Jesus. And I pray, God, that our minds will be filled with your truth and not the corruption of this ungodly day. And I pray that you will renew us in our heart and our love for you. And that through our seeking of you, as we draw near, that you will correct all the things that need correcting in our life by the work of your spirit and the influence of your word upon our mind. Maybe you're here today and you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior. I'm here to tell you that Jesus left the glories of heaven, took the lowliest state of a man, 
and came and died for your sin and for mine. And it's not enough to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. The devils believe that. But if you would, if you would surrender your life to him, make a commitment Bible calls it a covenant relationship. Marriage is a covenant relationship. It's a relationship that comes together when two people agree to form a relationship that will not be broken. And that's what God calls us to. If you've never done that, I want to invite you to join in that covenant with God today. We're not talking about religion. It's not a church that saves it's Christ that saves us. And you and I need Christ. Have you made that? Have you walked away from God? Have you made your peace? Today's the day. God wants to move in your life. If, if that's your heart, right where you are, with every eye closed, every head down, it, maybe today you just want to raise your hand and say, I, I, I need to get right with God. I, I need to, to know that Jesus is my Savior, that my sins are forgiven, that I can enter into a personal relationship with Him, that I can have the hope of heaven living in my heart forever. Maybe that's you. Is it? You want to raise your hand and make that commitment? Will you stand with me? Father, I pray you bless these patient people. I pray you bless them. I pray you put the, the blessing of your word in their heart. And I pray, God, that you will just reveal yourself to them in such a way that they will be strengthened. That that word will, God, be to them the very power of God at work in their life. We hold to your truth. We cling to it. We believe it. We apply it. And we're blessed by it. We thank you then, Lord. And we give you praise for all of your goodness. Let's do that. Father, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for your precious word. Go in the victory that is yours in Christ. God bless everyone. Let your glory fall. Let your glory fall.